Well, welcome everyone. We are happy you're able to join us this afternoon. We're certainly excited for what I think will be a great event. Um, before we get started today, I'd like to thank our Gavel 2020 sponsors, which at the platinum level, we have RSM US LLP. At the gold level, we have Cushman Wakefield Cresco Real Estate, Dollar Bank, and PNC Real Estate. At the silver level, we have Cohen & Company, First American Title Insurance Company, First Federal Lakewood, Marsh & McLennan Agency, Porter Wright Morris & Arthur LLP, Retzel, Walter & Haverfield LLP. And then at the bronze level, we have AE Compunt, Akron Cleveland Association of Realtors, Aerial Ventures LLC, ATC Group Services, Bellweather Enterprise, Duffy & Duffy Cost Segregation, First Financial Bank, Geist Companies, Interdeck PCI, Labella Associates, Marcus and Milchap, the Middlefield Banking Company, Ohio Desk Steelcase, Onyx Creative, M. Panzeca Development, Pride One Corporation, Sakura Law LLC, Omni Title LLC, and finally Thompson Hine LLP. Our featured speaker this afternoon will be Congressman Anthony Gonzalez. Anthony is proud to represent the Ohio 16th District in the U.S. House of Representatives. As a son and grandson of Cuban immigrants who fled the Castro regime, Congressman Gonzalez cherishes the opportunity to serve his country and the community as a member of the world's greatest legis legislative body. Uh, okay. Congressman Gonzalez serves on the House Science, Space, and Technology Committee and also on the Financial Services Committee, where he is the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee on Diversity and Inclusion. He's also a proud co-chair of the House China Task Force. Uh, with that, Anthony, I'd love to turn the floor over to you, and uh, we can't wait to hear your thoughts today. Well, thank you. Uh, thanks for, for having me, and, and thanks, everybody, for being on the call. Um, we got to send new talk about his greatest legislative body. We are, oof, we're not doing that these days. Uh, <laughs> but uh, maybe the most important, but, uh, but, but falling short of that mark. But in any event, um, well, thank you for, uh, for, for having me. I thought uh, where I'd, I'd like to start is, is maybe just provide an overview of, of where I think the, the latest round of, of uh, stimulus discussions lie. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you call it stimulus. I call it stabilization more than stimulus. But um, sort of where, where those lie, where I think uh, we might get some movement and, and what might be next. Um, and then I do want to spend a little bit of time on the HOPE Act uh, because um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, the, the HOPE Act is a piece of legislation that uh, I, I co-sponsored alongside of uh, Republican and Democratic colleagues uh, that would provide some, what I think is some much needed relief in the CMBS space in particular. Um, at, uh, at one point in my life, I was a NAOP member, actually. Um, and so, uh, so this is, um, it's, it's uh, a treat for me to be here. But I, I would like to go through that whole back just so everybody has it on their radar. Um, and I'll do that after, uh, after the COVID uh, relief updates. So, um, you know, with respect to where, where we are currently in, in Congress, uh, there, there is definitely a standstill. Um, Washington is in so many ways a leadership-driven town. Uh, both in the House and Senate, and, and certainly in the White House. And um, my general take is, you know, if, if leadership wants to get something done, they find a way to get it done. Uh, if leadership wants to drag their feet and make something a campaign issue, uh, that is what they do. Uh, and you know, as as rank and file members, that's always disappointing. But um, but that's uh, what we're always trying to work around. So uh, my current read is is that. Um, in a, it, it's not an, an overly serious set of negotiations right now uh, in, with respect to uh, what the, the House and the White House are working on, uh, but also what the Senate's doing. Um, and so uh, we're, we're trying to sort of in, in light of that, uh, I'm a part of a group called the Problem Solvers Caucus. It's 50 members, 25 Republicans, 25 Democrats. Uh, and what we're trying to do is just get people back to the table and get people back in a serious manner. Uh, and so for the last about three weeks now, um, a, a subset of that group, uh, there's six of us, three and three, uh, we've been working on our, our own uh, relief package uh, that we're hoping to, to release sometime in the next week or two um, just to get the conversation restarted and show that, you know, we're actually not that far apart um, when, you, when you approach this the way that a business owner would, frankly, and, and the way that we're approaching this is we're just saying, look, what's our goal? What do we think the goal of the package should be? 
uh, and and then you know the resources should fall off of that. So you know, sort of a bottoms up methodology as opposed to a top down methodology where somebody just throws out a you know a number and says, well, I want three trillion. Well, I want two trillion. I, want, I mean, it's like who does this? But anyway, um, so what what we're doing is is basically saying let's let's take that bottoms up approach. Uh, and the goal that that we see that we think makes the most sense uh, is to provide a bridge until March. Uh, now, why March? Uh, so there's there's two reasons for that. Number one, uh, no matter who wins the presidential election, March gives them a month, month and a half uh, to get their sea legs underneath them, get a you know get a strategy in place, um, and and go. Uh, so that's one element. Uh, and then the second element there is that you know when you look at the vaccine pipeline and you look at the capabilities uh, that that may be coming onto the market here you know in the next couple months uh march is sort of maybe i'm wishful thinking but march is when i look at it i say you know i think by march we're we're, we're sort of I'm not, we're not done with covid but it's it's not a question of you know can we manage it it's okay how many vaccines can we get delivered and you know what how we track on that front um and so that's that's sort of where, where the March timeline comes from. Uh, and I think that package will include uh, additional support for small businesses, uh, additional support for those who are vulnerable. So um, some supplemental unemployment insurance, not at the $600 a week mark, but um, you know something short of that, that, that wouldn't be a barrier for people coming back to work because we do hear that a lot. Uh, both sides hear that, frankly, that's not a Republican or Democrat issue. Um, some support for, for local governments, uh, who have been hard hit, um, and, and it would have to be documented, you know, COVID-related expenses and, and revenue shortfalls, uh, and then some liability protection. Uh, you may have seen uh, down at the State House that they've gotten their liability protection uh, done. Uh, it needs to go to the governor's desk to sign, but it, that has gone through both House and Senate uh, at the State House, which is great for Ohio. Um, and so uh, we're trying to, to make that a part of of our next package as well, just at a national level uh, to, to take care of all that. Um, so, you know, when, when you sort of add all, all the things that we have in, uh, our package would end up coming out roughly probably between 1.3 and, and 2 trillion, and it depends on the virus more than, so those, those numbers fluctuate based on how the virus is circulating. Um, so again, that is, is that the package? I don't know, but I, I will tell you that is um, what we're going to present here soon, again, in hopes of sending a message to leadership on both sides um, who, who I think are, are playing some games here uh, that, you know, the, the members, the members of Congress uh, can actually come together and, and want to come together uh, to, to find common ground that sort of bridges us to that March timeline, uh, where again, I think, I think the conversation shifts dramatically from a public policy standpoint um, in, on that time frame. So that's, that's how we're approaching that. Um, another component uh, which could be a part of, of any one of these relief packages is the HOPE Act. Um, and, and again, uh, the HOPE Act is, is designed, really our goal is to help out commercial real estate owners who have seen significant drops in revenue. It'll be particularly beneficial for those who are CMBS borrowers, but uh, you know, if you've seen a 30% or a 25% drop in revenue, which if you're a hotel or a retail space or something like that, it's, it's pretty likely that's, that's your world. Um, you know, we know that in particular in the CMBS space, your options are very limited. Um, and we know that in the CMBS space, again, in particular, um, you need some help uh, and, and some relief. And it has to be structured correctly so that you don't trip covenants. Um, and so, you know, what, what we've come up with is the HOPE Act, which creates a preferred equity lending facility uh, which will be guaranteed by by Treasury, um, and financial institutes will originate uh, the instrument to the borrowers. And I'm just going to read the terms for those of you who, who aren't familiar with it. Um, so, who's eligible? Uh, anybody who's borrowers who've experienced at least a 25% drop in revenue during any consecutive three-month period between March 1st, 2020, and February 28th, 2021. Uh, borrowers who had a debt service coverage ratio of at least 1.3 times on an annual basis in 2019, or at least 1.3 times DSCR on an annual basis in 17 and 18, uh, and the property cannot be owner occupied. What are the terms? Uh, borrowers have one year to draw down the amount. Uh, the instrument shall be unsecure and provides no right of foreclosure uh, and no voting rights. 
uh, 3% interest rate. Borrowers may prepay at any time without penalty, uh, and they should begin payment within two years of drawdown. Uh, instruments should amortize over seven years, beginning on the date of the first payment, uh, and it's redeemable if there's more than a 50% change in ownership. Um, how much are borrowers eligible for? A borrower may qualify for 10% of the outstanding debt owned on the commercial mortgage. So um, that's sort of the, the structure of it. Uh, and I know that was a lot. We can send, send out a, basically what I just read, um, if, the, if that's helpful. Um, but uh, again, the, the goal here is, you know, let's take care of a space that we know is, is hurting, uh, that we haven't taken care of yet. Uh, everything we've done so far was done on the assumption that, you know, what we're really dealing with here is something that's, that's sort of like uh, eminent domain, where the government has come in and shut things down and just said, you can't, I don't care, you can't use your property the way that you want. Uh, you can't run your businesses. You know, we're going to shut you down. Uh, so that we can make our way through the pandemic. No matter how you feel about that, uh, my belief is if that's what we're doing, then we need to compensate for that. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's where something like the Hope Act comes in, because we just know for sure that the PPP program, it helped a lot of people, it didn't really fit the real estate space. Um, some of the stimulus measures that, that we've done, similarly, it just doesn't quite fit for you guys. Um, and so uh, what we wanted to come up with is a, a separate idea um, that uh, hopefully we can get done uh, and provide some relief there. So um, that's all that on, on the HOPE Act uh, and COVID packages. Um, again, I, I just want to thank you all for, for having me here. Um, final thing I'll say before we go to questions or, or whatever, um, I'm an open book, so you can ask me anything you want uh, and I'll... Uh, Tell you whatever's on my mind and what I know. So, um, thanks, thanks again for having me, and uh, I will yield back if that's okay. Yeah, Anthony, I know one question a lot of our you know clients are certainly asking that received a lot of the PPP proceeds. Um, you know, as we get towards the end of the year and are doing a lot of um, you know tax planning, what the appetite was in Congress for. Um, you know, we have the guidance out there from Treasury about the proceeds not being taxable, but the expense, you know, you cannot be able to double dip and um, be able to also deduct the expenses. And, you know, we've had some commentary, it seems like there were um, some appetite on both sides to, you know, get something done, you know, in that respect, but I wasn't sure what your thoughts were on kind of where that stands or if that was going to be part of the bill you were introducing or. Um, yeah, so um, our bill that we're introducing is silent on that but there is a separate initiative to to do just that i mean it frankly when we voted on the original cares package we all thought we voted for that and then um and it's it's actually written in the bill that way uh and then treasury and the rulemaking process uh sort of went around us and and went with this double dipping uh mechanism that they're they're going for so um, that is a, a bipartisan push to correct that and just make it explicit that they can't reverse our uh, our intent uh, on that specific one. Um, and I, I should have mentioned this as well. I think in, in sort of a timeline for when we might see another package, um, the government, uh, we need to fund the government and that'll happen at the end of this month. Uh, and so, you know, I think where you might see a, a skinny deal of some kind is uh, right at that timeline. Um, if if uh, if somebody says, "Hey, look, we'll you know we'll keep the government open, but you have to do this, that, and the other um, on the stimulus side." So uh, that's that's timeline wise when you might see another deal. Um, but specific to your question on on that tax deductibility issue, um, we're we're working on that, and that is bipartisan right now. Another question um, we had gotten in was, you know, there had been some talk about how infrastructure fits into um, things now, you know, with obviously COVID-19 and having to provide some, you know, stabilization packages um, to kind of keep the economy going. We, um, do you have any thoughts on where that may fit in or is that, um, you know, tabled now that we've gotten to see if we've gotten another stimulus package to go and then obviously funding the government um, you know, with an election year, if this is something that's just going to kind of tail into next year and 
um, or where that kind of fits in. Yeah, I, I think this is one that, that we're going to pick up next year. Um, I hope we do. Uh, I, I don't see us picking it up this year only because, and this sort of gets back to, again, you know, why March? Like, where'd that come from? Um, our thought is, let's get through COVID. Let's make sure we manage the damage there. Uh, and then, you know, we'll, we'll know a lot more about the state of our economy uh, and where genuine stimulus needs to occur uh, at that point. Um, my belief is there, sh there should be two, economically, there should be two major initiatives that we undertake. One would be to reshore um, many elements of our supply chain, in particular in, in the medical and defense fields. Um, and then the second one is, is a, a pretty substantial infrastructure play. Um, I'm working on something right now that uh, I'm not quite ready to say what it is, but it's, uh, it would be a more sustainable way to get continued infrastructure investments uh, as opposed to having to do these sort of multi-trillion dollar bills every couple of years. Um, this would be uh, more of a sort of a self-funding mechanism um, that, that would allow for a ton of private capital to come in um, backstopped by, uh, by the federal government. So um, that's, uh, that's in the works as well. And I, I think, you know, we'll, we'll see where that debate goes, but I, I do suspect that, that there will be a pretty substantial infrastructure conversation, you know, right as, uh, again, either the president is reelected and, and he's beginning his second term or uh, Vice President Biden is ramping up uh, his administration. So um, I see that as a next year event. At this point, we'll open the floor up to anybody else that has, uh, you know, questions for the congressman. I think I see somebody has a hand up. Russ, Russ Crotelli. Yeah. Russ, you're muted. Um, so one question we just got. Um, well, the eviction freeze, while the eviction freeze is understandable to protect residents throughout work, um, why is there no recognition of the losses experienced by the lender? Or how is there going to be relief, you know, provided on the, the lender or the owner side? Yeah, again, um, great question. Uh, another hole that, that we haven't plugged yet. Uh, I've been trying to work with Fannie and Freddie and, and FHA to sort of figure out how we can we can shore up the back end of this um, because you're right there's sort of one thing to have an eviction moratorium but if you don't shore up the the liquidity shortfalls as a result um, it, it you know the buck stops somewhere um, and so we're we're trying to get uh, some relief there uh, or at least you know a better a better plan um, I'll, I'll just be honest I, I have not had great success with that um, and we've been hitting on this since March, uh, or I guess April. Um, but uh, so far, we, we keep getting pushback, um, and we haven't quite convinced the, the folks um, running those programs that, that uh, we need to do something additional there. Um, but, uh, but we will keep it up, because um, I, I, I hear, I've heard about this issue in multiple areas, and it just logically makes sense. So, um, so we'll uh, keep going, but, uh, but admittedly have not had success on that one yet. Um, do you expect any changes to the Main Street lending program? You know, under its current form, many of our clients are having get difficulty using it due to the lender restrictions and the debt guarantees. As a part yeah, of so great question. This is something that um, that we're suggesting in, in the problem solvers package that, that we're working on, um, which is basically to just have Treasury and the Fed just revamp the program. I mean, I, I think it's um, just I mean, if you're if you're trying to take advantage of this, you know that this is a 
so far this has been a flop. Um, there's been a lot of stuff that uh, I think has gone really well, um, but uh, but the Main Street Lending Flip program, it just, I mean, it's, it's actually embarrassing um, how little it's been used considering how much money's in it. So um, we're, again, that's, that's something that uh, we're trying to rectify um, as we head into uh, the next, um, the next stimulus negotiations. That's being said, uh, if you have specific recommendations, um, I'll tell you, you know, everybody kind of knows that the Main Street Lending Program hasn't kicked off the way we want, um, but nobody has the fix in mind. Uh, and, and I'll just tell you sort of politically the challenge there is, you know, it's politically it's very easy to say we're going to take care of, you know, mom and pop Main Street businesses, small businesses, the PPP program, those sorts of things. Um, all the bad stories that came out about the PPP program were sort of brand names that you know about. You know, why did Shake Shack get it? Why did Harvard's Endowment get it? Why, right? Like, so um, there's, that's where you get the, the backlash and the public gets, gets fairly upset. The Main Street program would, a lot of those businesses would be brand names. And, and so I think there's, there's a hesitancy from, uh, from Treasury in particular um, to, to do a lot there because I just frankly just don't, I think they they're not keen on the bad press. And I think members of Congress probably feel the same way. Um, that's a terrible reason not to do something, but, uh, but that's, um, that's the, the reality. Uh, and so we're trying to figure out, okay, if that's true, you know, let, let's think of a different program or, or let's adjust that program in a way that, you know, the, the American people will say, okay, this is fair. Uh, not only are we you know, helping out these, these larger businesses, but we're also helping out mom and pops and we're helping out you know, those who have been displaced and unemployed and those sorts of things. So you got, you got to get that balance all the way. Right. Um, and, uh, and admittedly uh, we're, we haven't coalesced around that the answer to that, um, though we all, we all know that the, the main street program just hasn't done what it's supposed to do. Um, another question that we had come through was, um, is there any status update on the EB-5 program um, as, an, as an important tool in Cleveland going forward? Um, Nothing on that. I have not heard anything on EB-5. Um, my staff's on the call. If they want to pipe in, I don't think, I have not heard anything on EB-5 um, lately. And I guess, I guess maybe a follow-up question. You, I know you addressed some of the CMBS um, items, you know, at the start, but um, do you see any lending facilities potentially being set up to backstop non-CMBS commercial real estate loans um, due to COVID-19 implications and the eviction moratorium? So this has been my push. Um, so just sort of inside baseball, the HOPE Act, uh, was constructed with CMBS in mind. My personal opinion is, look, you know, let's let's ask the business question: Which businesses are being hurt? Uh, okay, and how? And you know, we could say commercial real estate. How they choose to fund themselves, we should be agnostic on. Uh, if we want to help commercial real estate, we need to have a program that helps commercial real estate. If you're a CMBS borrower, it helps you, and if you're a traditional bank borrower, it helps you. Um, and so, you know, that, that's sort of the, the intellectual push that I've been making. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to try, should the HOPE Act come up for a vote, um, we're going to try to get uh, some, some changes to it uh, that would be sensitive to that. Um, because I, I just, you know, there's reasons why you go the CMBS route. There's reasons why you go the traditional bank route. Um, as a member of Congress and as a matter of policy, I don't think I should have a preference between you know, how you chose to fund your project. Um, I, I should, in my opinion, uh, have a preference to saying, okay, what industries are being hit and let's support those industries. Um, so that's, uh, that's sort of the, the, the push that, that I'm continuing to, uh, to leave here on, on the HOPE Act and, and anything else in the, in the real estate space. So 
one item uh, one of our attendees had brought up is that, you know, when you're looking for revenue positive items, you know, you think about the historic tax credit and, you know, kind of what it does in that space. Is there anything, uh, talk about, I guess, anything related to that with any of the stimulus bills or is it, um, you know, pretty much business as is for right now with that? Uh, I think for right now it's business as is, but I'll just tell you, I mean, people are generally supportive. I, I don't hear anybody um, out uh, trying to to do anything bad with the historic tax credits. I think everybody um, generally agrees this has been, you know, pretty pretty strong uh, provision in the in the tax code uh, that that we need to continue and frankly I would argue double down on. Um, so uh, I I suspect you know, anything that we do will be reflective of of that general opinion, which is, you know, people are, are pretty much in favor uh, across the board here. Have you heard anything um, in Congress related to reinstating Section 118? Um, this was one of the provisions that was changed as part of picture that was used that was used to prevent um, a lot of the state grant income programs from being taxable um, to the grant recipients and a lot of our developers were able to utilize this grant money um, you know as part of their project without having to pick up taxable income on day one um, do you know if there's any appetite um, you know for that a change kind of to the so old we have not again that's one that that uh, no one has brought that to us, and I, ha I have not heard it on any of our calls. So um, I would su suspect that's that one's off the radar. But um, but we're happy to look into it, and, and we can follow up, obviously, and you all can distribute the information. But um, that that one has not come up uh, in the last few months. I know we're getting close to 1.30. Um, anyone else with any additional questions for the congressman? Anthony, I'm not seeing anything else come through at the moment, at least. Um, or let's see, hold on, we got maybe one more here. Um, so it looks like the question, um, and this may just be more of a comment or a statement, but. Uh, from one of the attendees, but it says access to labor is consistently what developers will tell you has been uh, one of their number one challenges in this past year. And, um, you know, some of the programs that have been restricting access to labor, like temporary visas, have certainly, you know, compounded this problem. But, um, you yeah, know, that was just, I guess, more of um, a statement, I guess, more than a question. Uh, and I agree with. And then we have one more question. Um, is there any thoughts on how the COVID-19, if there's any going to be any impact on an opportunity zone um, legislation or possibly extending, um, you know, some of the gain recognition dates and maybe yeah. the dates that the zones will be, you know, in, you know, in recognized? Yeah, we were actually working on this pre-COVID. Um, uh, but uh, I think, again, sort of once we get through these next few months and, and I would argue sort of get past the virus, uh, that's when I think you'll see these conversations like, you know, okay, what do we do with opportunity zones? Um, what do we do with historic tax credits? What do we do with infrastructure? I think that's where all these questions are gonna start being answered. Um, and uh, my sense is, you know, cause we'll be through the presidential cycle that opportunity zones will become very popular again. They've sort of become a partisan tool in the last couple of months as we approach the, the election, um, uh, which is silly, but 
uh, that's that's politics. So, um, but I, I, I suspect once we get past this election, um, we'll get back to where it's always been, which is opportunity zones where bipartisan initiatives. So, um, I, I think we'll we'll see us revisit that and um, maybe reset the clock or extend the deadlines and, and those sorts of things. So, um, I'm I'm hopeful on that one. And maybe last but not least here, um, I know you've kind of mentioned this, but do you have any general thoughts on the economy? Um, you know, a lot of the administration's been talking about a V-shaped recovery, but, you know, obviously with commercial real estate, it will likely not bounce back like um, in a V-shape uh, with a lot of structural changes to the retail and office market, you know, in the hotels and which you mentioned previously. But, um, you know, I guess do you – have any general thoughts on that? I think it'll look like this. Um, so not quite a V, um, but uh, you know, where you, you kind of have this big drop and it's, we, we're bouncing back. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, and most of the numbers look, look like they're moving in the right direction. Uh, but my sense is, uh, you know, it'll, it'll start to, the pace of improvement will start to level off. Um, you know, I've, I've in my head, I've targeted 7% unemployment as sort of where it starts to, to really slow down again. Uh, and so that's why, um, again, I, I think the focus, you know, as soon as we get through all this is, is how do we get people back to work quickly and, and with good paying jobs. Uh, and that's where you'll see infrastructure, reshoring, reskilling, retooling, um, and, uh, and getting our workforce uh, up to speed again. So. Um, the faster we can do that, the quicker the recovery, in, in my estimation. Uh, and so that's, I'm somebody who is constantly thinking about, you know, if that's where we're headed, what set of policies should I be working on now so that we have something ready-made um, once once uh, we're, we're to that point. But yeah, I think it's, it's not quite a V, in my opinion, it's not quite a V. I think it's sort of a, a hard dip and, and then it'll start to level off uh, at some point. But um, if we do the right things, uh, from a genuine stimulus standpoint, uh, I think that'll uh, that'll be ultimately the right set of policies that that push it more like a V. Well, with that, I know we've uh, we've just hit a little past one thirty, but um, you know, Congressman, I just want to thank you. It's always awesome to have your time and um, you know have your thoughts on things. So uh, we certainly appreciate having you and. Um, look forward to hopefully having you join us again here soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Good to be with you all. I know.